today's approach to ataxia, we're going to dive into it and make sure that we divide and conquer so that we can, you know, um, deal with this. Now, the rationale for this particular objective is that neurologic abnormalities, okay? So this is under neurology. Neurologic abnormalities of gait can result from disorders affecting several levels of the nervous system. The type of abnormality observed clinically often indicates the site affected. Okay. Now, the causal condition. So if it comes to ataxia, you need to make sure that you've mastered cerebral ataxia, okay? Cerebral ataxia, and then um, that is when you are dealing with the signs of cerebral dysfunction, like this didactyl kinesia, um, um, you know, the patient is not able to do a lot of good nose to finger points testing. The patient has, you know, an unsteady gait, all those, all those features of cerebral ataxia. And the cause of cerebral ataxia can be like a tumor in the cerebellum, okay? It can be a vascular issue. It can be hereditary issues. It can be multiple sclerosis. It can be drugs, which can affect the cerebellum. It can be alcohol. So you've got to, when you're learning, so for example, if you come under an objective like this, you've got to take your time and ask yourself, if you go into your various, like up-to-date Dynamed, whatever uh, book you're using, ask yourself, cerebellar disease, take your time and just break everything down. Then we come to uh, sensory ataxia, vest vestibular issues, proprioceptive issues, vascular. Then we go to other movement disorders. And that's why I've highlighted on Parkinson's disease, right? And you'll understand why I've highlighted on that. And other central nervous system disorders. So until you've covered all these topics, you are not done with this particular topic, right? You are not done with this particular objective. So this is what I was saying was that don't just look at the objective, but go to the causal conditions. And then that will give you a better view about the things you need to cover there. Now, the key objective and the approach to ataxia is very simple, that given a patient with a gait disturbance, the candidates will distinguish ataxia from other irregularities. So you've got to know, how do I differentiate maybe Parkinson's from multiple sclerosis? How do I differentiate, you know, ataxia itself, a patient with an ataxic gait from other causes of abnormal gait, okay? The candidates will determine localization, etiology, outcome and complications, and will initiate an appropriate management plan. I move on. So you realize that when it comes to ataxia, so if you are taking things like cerebral ataxia, maybe a tumor, you should be able to locate the, you should be able to tell in your MCQ1 the location of the tumor. You should be able to tell what causes or what are the risk factors for that particular thing. You should be able to tell what that tumor can do. You should be able to tell what are the complications of that particular condition. And you must also be able to tell the management. All right? Good. Now, the enabling objectives, given a patient with a gait disturbance, the candidate will, one, list and interpret um, critical findings, including those derived from an appropriate history and physical exam, aimed at differentiating between ataxia and other causes of gait disturbance and at establishing the, localize, the localization and cause. Number two, List and interpret critical investigations, including appropriate laboratory and diagnostic imaging investigations. So if you take multiple sclerosis, how are you going to um, um, assess a patient with multiple sclerosis? If you take a patient with Parkinson's disease, how are you going to assess the patient? If you take a patient with cerebellar dysfunction, how are you going to do that, right? And then construct an effective initial management plan, including determining whether specific management or specialized care is required. So you remember all those causal conditions we talked about? If you are learning them, you have to learn them under these three major subheadings. Clinical, clinical investigations, critical findings, invest, um, interpreting of those in investigations, whether blood work or imaging, and then how I'm going to manage them. All right, good. So today... And I think what we'll do is, um, I'm going to change the strategy for the class today. We will first start with some questions so that you just test your knowledge in the subject. 
And then we will use the rationale and the uh, answer points to review. Then after that, I get into the high yield stuff that you need to know so far as that particular topic is concerned, right? So that's how we're going to go through the, 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 the class today. So we're going to deal with Parkinson's disease and someone will say, why, why are we dealing with Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's disease, you realize, is a second commonest um, cause of like ataxia and memory, ataxia plus memory concerns after Alzheimer's. And remember always that when you are learning for the exam, learn common things. Common things are common, okay? So Parkinson's disease is what we're going to focus on today in our ataxia um, lecture. Somebody should read this case for us right away. Somebody should volunteer and read this case for us right away, please. A 65-year-old man presents with a two-year history of progressive tremor, stiffness, and slowness of movement. He reports difficulty getting up from a chair and has noticed that his handwriting has become smaller. He denies any falls, but reports occasional lightheadedness when standing. On examination, there is a resting tremor in his right hand, cogwheel rigidity in the upper limbs, and bradykinesia. His posture is stooped, mm -hmm. and he has difficulty initiating gait. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial treatment for this patient? A. Amantadine, B. Levodopa capidopa, C. Deep brain stimulation, D. Selegiline, E. Trihexafenidine. Doctor, I really like the way you read this case. Seriously. You have a very soothing, wonderful voice, a very great voice to read. So, um, everybody, please type in your answers. And it looks like, you know, people are going for B, 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 B. A lot of people are going for B. Please, those on Facebook. I want to see your answers as well, okay? Those on Facebook, I want to see your answers as well. And the doctor read it so beautifully, frankly. It was, it's, it's awesome. B, B is the answer. So what is, what, what, what is the issue here? Remember that this patient, two-year history of progressive tremor, he has stiffen, stiffening and slowness of movement, okay? He reports difficulty getting up from a chair and has noticed that his handwriting has become smaller. That is what we call micrographia. Now, he denies any falls. So in reality, the question is telling that there's no trauma, but reports occasional lightheadedness when standing. Probably he has some postural hypotension or something. On examination, there's resting tremor in his right hand, cocoa rigidity in the upper limbs, and bradykinesia. His posture is stooped, okay? And he has difficulty initiating gait. So the basically, what is the, which of the following is the most appropriate initial treatment for this patient? So the summary of this question is that which of the following medications, if I should summarize everything in the question set, which of the following medications is the most appropriate medication we give to a patient with Parkinson's disease? That's it. With all the English up there, that is all that the question is talking about. And the answer is levodopa cabidopa. Now, why? Levodopa cabidopa, so please take note of this, is the most effective treatment for motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease particularly in older patients or those with significant functional impairment. Now, it improves symptoms of bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor. That's why you give levodopa, cabidopa, right? Now, why is amantadine wrong? Amantadine, now note this, may be used in early or mild Parkinson's disease or as an adjunct to treat dyskinesia, but it is not the first line. So please, today, the learning point is this. We can use amantadine, but amantadine is not our first line. The best use of amantadine is to use it as a supportive medication to leverage dopa cabidopa. Okay, good. Now, what about deep, deep, deep brain stimulation? Why is it a wrong answer up option? Deep brain stimulation is considered an advanced Parkinson's disease when medication is no longer effective. But this patient has not tried any medication yet. Doctors, please, are you tracking with me? I need to know. Are you tracking with me? If you're tracking with me, just type yes, yes, yes. And then let's go. Why is deep brain stimulation wrong? Is it not an option? It is. But we use it in 
later stages. We don't use it as, you know, the first line. You know, when medication is no longer effective, why is selegiline wrong? As a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, selegiline is often used in early Parkinson's disease or as an adjunct, but is not as effective as levodopa cabidopa in managing significant symptoms. So, which other medi which medications can we use to support levodopa cabidopa? Number one, amantadine. Number two, selegiline. When do we use deep brain stimulation when the Parkinson's disease is very advanced, okay? What about trihexyphenidyl? This anticholinergic drug is used primarily to treat tremor in younger patients. But this patient, let me check his age again. He's 65. But it's side effects limited to use, especially in older adults. So you see, this is the reason why I like um this lecture format because then we even get to learn a lot from just one question so that by the time we get to the lecture part we are good doctors please are you all tracking with me and do you like this approach better so we deal with questions you try them you make mistakes you get some right and then we go into the lecture itself all right okay good all right okay let's go Let's go to the next question. I want someone to read this case for us. Dr. Bruni, can I? Yes, please. Why not? Read it. Let's a go. A 72-year-old woman with a 10-year history of Parkinson's disease presents with new onset visual hallucinations. She sees people in her house who are not there. Her current medications include levodopa, carbidopa, premipexol, and resagilin. She has no history of psychiatric disorders. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? Option A, increase levodopa, carbidopa dose. B, add haloperidol. C, discontinue premipexol. D, start clozapine. E, uh, add don donpizil. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay so it's a 10 year history of parkinson's yes. and visual hallucinations onset mm -hmm. uh okay who are not there her current medications include levodopa cabidopa mm -hmm. no history of psychiatric disease mm -hmm. the most appropriate next step in the management exactly okay. clozapine what? clozapine yeah oh you're going to because... start clozapine okay so she's going for d who is going for a different answer let me see People are going for D, 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 D. Interesting. Hmm. Does someone have a different answer? Some are going for B, add haloperidol. Some are going for D. Oh, and Dr. Bernard went for C, discontinued promipexol. Dr. Margaret is also going for C. So it looks like we have B, C, and D fighting now. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell that Parkinson's is not people's favorite topic at all. <laughs> <laughs> but by the end of the class today, Parkinson's will be a thing of the past, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. The answer is C. The answer is C. Facebook gang, I didn't see your answers at all. The answer is C. Why is C? This continued promipexol. Why? Now pick your books and then let's write this down. Number one, dopamine agonists such as promipexol are known to cause hallucinations. That's the issue. Promipexol is known to cause hallucinations, particularly in older patients. So reducing or discontinuing this medication is the first step in management, in managing drug-induced hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. So please, mm -hmm. this is the learning point here. Uh -huh. This is the learning point mm -hmm. here. Okay? This is the learning point here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Now, the question, the answer option says, a, increase levodopa cabidopa dose. Increasing mm -hmm. levodopa cabidopa dose could worsen the hallucinations. Mm -hmm. So that is wrong. So today, our learning points are coming up. In two questions, we are learning so much. The first thing is that in a patient who is um, who has neurologic issues, if you see that the patient is having visual hallucinations and the patient is on a very high dose of cabidopa or levodopa, or the patients on primipexol, those are the two medications you want to consider 
either reducing the dose or discontinuing them. Levidopa, cabidopa can cause hallucinations. Pamipexol can also cause hallucinations. But why was A wrong? If A had stated decrease the dose of levidopa, cabidopa, then A would have mm. rather been correct. Right, doctors, please, are you tracking with me? Please, I want to make sure. Are you tracking with me? Are you tracking with me? Are you tracking with me? Okay, good. Yeah. Now, add haloperidol. Why is that wrong? Haloperidol is a typical antipsychotic that can worsen Parkinson's symptoms due to dopamine antagonism. It is not recommended in Parkinson's disease. So, haloperidol on its own can make the symptoms of Parkinson's disease worse. Mm -hmm. Number three, why is starting close up in wrong? Because a lot of people went for that. Starting close up in a lot of people went for that. Okay. Um, although close up in is effective for treating hallucinations in Parkinson's, it is generally reserved for cases where reducing or discontinuing offending drugs is not sufficient. So you see, in in, in the medical management of patients, if you have a mm. patient who is on a particular medication, okay? And the patient is having some bad side effects to that medication. And there's mm -hmm. another medication which can counteract the side effects of the first medication. Mm -hmm. The first step is not to introduce a new medication when if you reduce the dose of the existing medication, it can still give you the same results. Doctor, are you following what I'm saying? So yes. the patient is on medication A. And the patient is having side effects of medication A, right? Hmm. Now, we know that we can give medication B to, the, to, to stop the side effects of medication A. But at the same time, we also know that we can reduce the dose of medication A or stop medication A and get the same effect. The good clinician will rather discontinue that medication, which is giving those side effects, or reduce the dose. It is when the doctor has tried those ones on medication A that he's not getting the result that he will introduce medication B. So here, we know that cabidopa levidopa can cause hallucinations. We've learned that pramipexol um, um, can also cause hallucinations. But we've not stopped pramipexol. We've not decreased the dose of levidopa cabidopa. But we are introducing clozapine. In reality now, the patient is taking three medications which is not good. Meanwhile, we can stop pramipexol and the effects of hallucinations can go away and the patient will still be on only the levidopa cabidopa. Doctors, please, are you following me? Because mm -hmm. remember yes, that yeah. we, are, we, are, we are learning choosing wisely concepts and we're also learning using the least effective power to gain maximum output. Number mm -hmm. four, why is donepezil wrong? Add, adding donepezil is wrong in this situation because donepezil is used to treat dementia associated with Parkinson's disease. But this patient's concern is hallucinations. Now, doctors, you know, this is just the second question. We have so many questions to do today. I want someone to summarize our learning points today for this particular issue, hallucinations and Parkinson's disease. In relation to pramipexol, Haloperidol, levodopa, cabidopa, clozapine, and donepezil. I want a volunteer, please. So, Dr. Bruni, you said that uh, increasing the dose of carbidopa and levodopa could worsen the patient's condition because the patient is suffering from visual hallucinations. It can worsen the patient's visual hallucinations. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And the other one, haloperidol, also uh, not recommended because it's an uh, also worsens the Parkinson's disease, right? Yes. So this one and the clozapine, as you mentioned that when we cannot decrease because the main culprit is the medication, Premipexol. So yeah. we have to stop, discontinue this medication. Mm -hmm. uh, so we cannot, we can just use clozapine in that one if we are unable to discontinue the medication uh premipexol right well you want to first reduce the dose or discontinue yes. it but if you know it's a life and death issue and the patient has to be on premipexol that is when you introduce close up in right? close up in yes mm -hmm. and don't puzzle you said that it's just used to treat the parkinson's disease 
but in not no, in this no. case it because is used the to patient treat... is suffering no, from visual hallucinations. Doctor, yeah. it is used to treat the dementia part yes. of Parkinson's disease. Dementia of Parkinson's disease, but this patient is suffering mm -hmm. from visual hallucinations, visual hallucinations so yeah. that will not be cured mm -hmm. by Don Pizzle. Yes, beautiful, beautiful, okay. beautiful. Dr. Michaels, you raised your hand. Please ask your question or bring your contribution. Oh, another thing why haloperidol is not indicated in the question, they said she doesn't have any psychiatric um, issues. So yeah. these are, are not indicated in this case. Beautiful. 